There's a lot of talk about things like dynamic pricing, revenue management, RevPAR, ADR. Do you have any idea what any of those mean? Today's guest, Ian McHenry of Beyond Pricing, is going to explain them all, as well as tell us why we should be looking at dynamic pricing as a way of maximising our occupancy. Stay tuned. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. As ever, I am so delighted to be back with you. So conference season has sort of come and gone now. If you've been to any of these conferences recently, you probably got acronymed out. You heard so many different abbreviations and shortenings of things that maybe you didn't ask what they were about. I know that it was a long time before I got up the courage to ask what an OTA was. I'd been actually using it. I'd been talking about it for a number of years because I heard it all the time and I think I was getting it in the right context, but I didn't actually know what OTA stood for. Somebody in one of our recent office hours session, asked the question. She said, I hear this all the time. Can you tell me what OTA means? Yes, people, it means online travel agency. Do not ever be afraid to ask what an acronym is. This business is throwing out so many abbreviations now that we need to, we need to create a glossary of abbreviations. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. If not, maybe I shall just, I should just create, create one you know, PMS, property management system, RevPAR, ADR. Mm, Yeah, I needed to ask Amy Hynote after she did her data management conference in Atlanta what some of these things meant because I'm hearing them. I wasn't completely understanding what they are. So in today's episode, we're actually going to be talking about some of these and clearing the air on acronyms. But that's not all. For a long time, and so certainly in our business, we've just gone along and we have two sets of pricing. We have pricing for summer and we have pricing for low season. And that seems to have worked pretty well for the last 16 years. But you know, things are changing. There's a lot more supply at different times of the year. There's demand goes up, demand goes down, but we haven't been changing the way we price. And it's uh, to give you one example, here in Ontario, the peak weeks of the summer are the last week of July and the first week of August, because these usually encompass one of our long weekends, which is called the Civic Holiday Weekend, which is the 1st of August. And that's those are the two weeks when most people want to go on vacation. They're in huge demand. Those are the weeks that get booked up first. Yet our pricing is the same for the entire summer. We don't have a lower pricing for the first week of high season, which historically gets less occupancy than every other week because, you know, the children have just finished school. And most families don't want to go on vacation starting on the Friday or the Saturday after their kids have finished school. But it's still high season. It still usually takes in the another long weekend for us, which is the July 1st weekend, which is Canada Day. So it's a high season weekend. And if we were to rent out the weekend itself, that should be at a higher price. But if we're renting out the whole week, including that weekend, then perhaps it should be lower than high season pricing because it's not in such great demand. And when we start thinking about all the different times of the year where we have high demand and lower supply, then of course we should be raising our prices accordingly. 
because guests are willing to pay a higher price. And I'm definitely not talking about gouging. And that's something I'm going to be asking my guest today about when we talk about things that they, they, in fact, they call it the Super Bowl effect, which is at that time when a massive event comes into your location and the supply just balloons because everybody with a spare room wants to rent it out and that they think that they can achieve the highest price possible. But of course, because of that high supply, there is, even though the demand is there, the supply is really exceeding the demand. So I'm just a novice at this and I'm going to be asking Ian McHenry from Beyond Pricing to explain all this to me and much more in today's episode. So without further ado, Let's go on over and talk to Ian. So I'm super happy to have with me today Ian McHenry from Beyond Pricing, and he's going to tell us everything about dynamic pricing and revenue management and explain it all. Ian, thank you so much for joining me. Super glad to be with you, Heather. I've followed you for so long, and I'm really glad we get a chance to, to chat uh, with you and with everybody who listens. Well, this is this is great because I've I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and really glad we're going to get this in this year. So, I want to kick off with well, no, let's let's kick off with you just giving us a brief rundown on Beyond Pricing when you started, how how you got into the business, and where the company is now. Sure, of course. Um, so, Beyond Pricing is software for vacation rental owners and property managers to help them. Uh, automatically price their vacation rental. We only focus on vacation rentals. Um, I previously spent my uh, the last decade or so in travel, you know, mostly with airlines, a little bit with hotels, helping them with uh, revenue management and dynamic pricing. And they all had software to figure out how to increase rates for you when you're trying to fly on Thanksgiving uh, or give you rock bottom rates to fly to Phoenix in the dead of summer. Um, and when we saw, they looked at the vacation rental space, there was nothing there to do that back in 2013 when we started. Um, and so we started, uh, beyond pricing to, to do that. Um, we're now, uh, about 60 people based in San Francisco, but with offices and folks all around the world. That's fantastic. Great growth, Ian. It's wonderful to see. Oh, thanks. It's fun. So let's, let's, there's a lot of acronyms and abbreviations and jargon out there and, I want to make it easier for you to talk to me. So let's get those <laughs> let's get those out of the way before we start. So yep. let's have a little bit of an explanation about, you know, what is dynamic pricing and revenue yep. management? Is there a difference between them or do they both mean the same thing? It's a great question. Um, th- th- there is a debate in this across. It's not just in vacation rentals. It's in hotels. It's in airlines, how they talk about it. You know, revenue management is is kind of a broad I, I think of it a little bit broader than pricing revenue management talks about all the ways that you can uh, manage revenue for for your vacation rental um, properties which includes uh, not just how you change prices but also how you market uh, how you how you do promotions how you do all those sorts of things but it usually usually when somebody talks about revenue management they're primarily talking about pricing um, so dynamic pricing is kind of a subset of, of the broader revenue management space, um, but the two often are, are equated to be the same. Um, dynamic pricing at the end of the day really just means changing your prices based on changes in supply and demand. So instead of having static pricing, static rates, uh, where you might set them once a year, you know, and have a, have a couple seasons, um, dynamic pricing is constantly changing your rates based upon changes that you see in demand. Uh, and it's it's what airlines and hotels have been doing for decades. Okay. And when we all understand that, we all understand about, I mean, it used to be years ago that if you left, if you left booking your flight until the very last minute, you get the best price. And now it sort of seems to have changed around. And uh, if you do it yeah. so many months out, two or three months out, then you're going to get the best price. And uh, But we know it, it fluctuates by the hour. And I, I know when I've, when I've gone on to book a flight and something happened and I didn't finish the transaction and you go back a couple of hours later, the price has changed. And <laughs> yeah. So, so I, think, I think we're all familiar with that. Let's have a couple yeah. more that I'm hearing about. What is RevPan and RevPAR? 
<laughs> yes. Uh, so rev par is the original kind of term that came from hotels. And it just means revenue per available room. And so a hotel might have 200 rooms. And, you know, the, the things that kind of feed into rev par, a good way to think about rev par is it's what you're, and, and this is probably, what I'm sure what you want to ask next. It's what was the average rate that you charged? And then what percentage of those rooms were occupied? If you multiply those together, you get your revenue per available room, basically. So that, that's kind of the hotel way of doing that. So you might, for a given night, have, um, say, 200 rooms, right? Um, and if you may charge an average of $100, maybe some, like you said, sold earlier for 50 and some sold later at 200 But the average across your 200 rooms was $100 per night. And you sold about half of those rooms, uh, so you had a 50% occupancy. Then if you multiply those together, your revenue per available room would have only been $50. Now, if you had 100% occupancy at $100, your revenue per available room would be $100, if that makes sense. And it was there as a way to say, how do we balance the, the goal of getting really, really high nightly rates with wanting to maintain as much occupancy as possible? Um, and so you'd use that as the best measure to say, heck, how much revenue at the end of the day did I make? Because anybody could get 100% occupancy if they charged $1 a night, mm. but then your average night daily rate would be much, well, you know, would only be $1. And so rev par was this great way to say, hey, what's, what truly at the end of the day did I make more? You know, how much money did I make per room? And it also helps you balance things. Uh, and sorry, I know this is more of an explanation than you needed, but <laughs> it's really actually important and interesting. Um, because you could actually have less occupancy but have higher rev par. So if you could charge $50 a night and get 100% occupancy, or you could charge, um, you know, say uh, $70 a night and get uh, 90% occupancy, you're actually better off uh, only getting 90% occupancy because mm-hmm. the rev par, those two multiplied, would be $63 per night, $70 times 90%, $63. Uh, versus the 50 times 100%, $50. And so it's a good way to capture that trade-off between increasing rates and then potentially having lower occupancy. That was uh, hotels. Now, they have 200 rooms. Rev Pan is this interesting concept, and you know you can debate where it came from, but we I, I don't know that it existed before we came around. Um, but the problem was, you know that's great for you if you manage, say, 100 vacation rentals or 200 vacation rentals. You can look up the revenue per available property, but to that owner, uh, they don't think about that. They have one night and it's either booked or not booked. <laughs> so revenue per available night is a metric that you um, you can't really use for a single property for a single night, um, but you can use it for a given month. So you might have 30 available days in a month and you might book half of them, say again, at that $100 rate, and then your revenue per available night uh, would be that fifty dollars, and so that's the term that's very unique to vacation rentals, simply because you know you have a single property with a single owner rather than having two hundred. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier to communicate to the owner of a property, you know, how much revenue they made for their available nights. Okay, I, sorry, that was very long winded, <laughs> but it, but it actually made sense to me, which is Good. which is excellent. Good. What about did did we cover ADR? Yeah, and so that's just average daily rate. Okay. Um, it, it's just the amount that you charged. Um, now, some folks will debate whether or not that's just the room rate or whether it includes fees. You just kind of want to pay a bit attention, uh, a bit of attention to that, you know, uh, because some folks will have, you know, the, a large fees on top of that. Um, mm-hmm. When we talk about it, uh, you know, it's just you want to make sure people are clear about that. Typically, we think about it as just the average uh, room rate. Uh, or the average nightly rate, um, you know, that you charge in, in just the, um, that part of it, not including taxes, fees, and all those sorts of things. Okay, clear as actually clear as day. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and is there anything else that's out there in in terms of abbreviations and acronyms that we should know about? Well, there's all different kinds of ways people can, uh, you know, cut things, but the, those are the, those are the main, most important ones. You have your your ADR, you have your occupancy, and then you have your rev pan uh, in our space, which is just the combination of those. Um, some people will talk about revenue uh, per booked night. That's slightly different. That says 
you know, instead of looking at all your available nights, uh, you know, what, you know, what was the average for all those ones that got booked, but that's more or less your, um, the same thing as your ADR. But yeah, those are the three main ones to focus on. Okay. Um, that, that's great. That makes oh, it. Oh, I got one more for okay. you. LOS. <laughs> Most people don't. Length of stay. Uh, one, one kind of other metric people focus on. What is your length of stay? Um, but less used there. Okay. I'm just, just making a note of that one. LOS. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Great. So that, that's a good foundation. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good foundation. So, Great. you know, we're talking here about data and, you know, yep. ma- many of us don't even look at that. We just, you know, it, it's just property gets booked, revenue comes yep. in, that's it. Yep. But having this data allows for this ability to change the pricing according to yep. demand. Well, I yep. found really interesting. So when I was delving into this, I went onto the Beyond Pricing website and went to your blog. Yep. And I was, mm. f- first of all, you guys really get around. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you've been traveling a In lot. In a good way. Yeah, you've been traveling <laughs> a lot for conferences. You went to Israel for, for Guest Eval. You've been to Scottsdale yep. for the Streamline Conference. Um, Las Vegas for ResFest. I know you're at VRMA. So you do get around, but in your blog, you show data from each city that you go to. And I just wanted you to sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put links to those blog posts in the show notes so people can go and have a look because I found them fascinating. So pick one and tell me what's, what do you look at when you see that data and what does it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, one of the kind of key things, and that's really exciting that that um, has happened in the last five years, is not just us, but um, even HomeAway uh, and, and Airbnb and others um, have surfaced more data for everybody, which is really, really great. Um, and that data will let you see not just your own listings, but you know across the board, what are these fluctuations in occupancy, right? What are the high occupancy periods? And it's really illuminating because you start to learn you know, really interesting things, um, you know, uh, and, and you can move from just having that gut, right, um, from that. And so, you know, I think one of the ones we, we showed, I mean, obviously, was we're, we're headed to Las Vegas uh, tomorrow for, for ResFest. Las Vegas is this uh, really interesting market. And we really nerd out about this. We feel like literally when people go on vacation, um, and not just for conferences, but on their own vacation, uh, they're required to come back and, you know, show what the, the major events in that market were and, and show us this occupancy graph. I mean, really nerd out about this stuff. But what that data will show you is like all these interesting events, you know, that you might not think were as, as big drivers of demand as, as you would expect. And so in Vegas, for instance, um, obviously a lot of people go there for New Year's Eve, but you actually see more demand for these big conferences like the um, Consumer Electronics Show, which is a few weeks afterwards. Um, as well as like EDC and and these other sorts of events, and so those are always super interesting to us and, and surprise a lot of people. Um, or or even like little ones, you know, we were uh, it, the team was in Atlanta for uh, a data conference that VRM Intel put on, um, and and we we're looking at the data, and you'll actually see that Atlanta has this kind of nice big peak for for Comic Con, you know, which you most usually associate with San Diego. They have the largest Comic-Con, um, but it ends up being like one of the largest events there. Um, and so just looking, you know, regardless of what you're, you're doing with software or what you're doing, just looking at this data um, helps you kind of see what are those peak periods and what are those um, periods of really high demand um, so that you can prepare for that and potentially increase or decrease your prices based on that. Well, while we're talking about events, tell tell me what yes. or explain to us what you mean by the Super Bowl effect. Yes, it's this thing that we've been tracking every single year for the last five or six years, and it's really really interesting because we got into this because um, there, there's this interesting uh, effect where um, the Super Bowl is coming to a town, right, and uh, hotels will increase prices significantly, right? They might go from two hundred dollars a night to a thousand or more dollars a night. And then what happens is, you know, there's lots of, you know, lots of people see that. They think the Super Bowl's coming. I'm going to list my house, which is usually not a vacation rental, um, but I'm going to list on Airbnb or HomeAway or somewhere. Uh, and I'm going to charge $2,000 a night because I said, you know, I see all the hotels are really high price. It's the Super Bowl. It's the biggest event of the year. And oh, by the way, maybe the local new, well, first of all, I'm going to list it for $2,000. Um, so they put that on there. 
Uh, and then the local news sees all these listings that are $2,000 a night. Oh my gosh. You can, and they report it as, look at how much money people are making. Um, and then what happens is everyone's like, oh my gosh, I, I could make thousands of dollars as well. I'm going to list my property. And suddenly you see this huge increase in supply. A bunch of people are putting their properties on them. And, and, the, and often they, they are not the type of properties that Somebody who's paying thousand, you know, a ticket to the Super Bowl is two, three thousand dollars and up, uh, you know, for basic tickets. When they're spending that kind of money, they're not so worried about spending a thousand dollars to go to the W or wherever it might be. And so these folks who are then suddenly listing their suburban home that's, you know, probably like my home growing up, not exactly where somebody throwing all this cash around would actually want to stay, they don't end up booking those. And so you have this effect where there's a huge increase in supply, way more than demand. And you actually end up not because of the oversupply, not really being able to charge that much for those, um, for those nights. Um, and, and one of the key parts about this is it's, you know, it's often just the wrong inventory for, for people going to the Super Bowl. These are usually people with a lot of money to throw around and they like, you know, they want to stay in a really luxury type place. Um, on the flip side, the very luxury places, which are, um, you know, fewer and further between, they actually can achieve that. But if you think your studio in, uh, you know, downtown Atlanta uh, is going to go for $2,000 a night because people don't want to pay that for the W, um, you might want to think again. And does that show itself, you know, we're talking Super Bowl here, other sort of other events yeah. where, where this, this shows up as well? Yeah, yeah, we have this. <laughs> it's funny. The the other phenomenon uh, that we've talked about was it's it's really these kind of once in a lifetime ones where nobody really has good data, uh, at least in that city, but often in general about um, you know what you know what they should do in response to it. And so um, we have another one that was the uh, when the Pope came to visit Philadelphia. This is a stale reference now, but it was uh, gee maybe three four years ago. Um, and the Pope was coming to Philadelphia and everyone thought this would be this huge event. Um, and all the hotels increased their prices again to thousands of dollars. Everybody listed their, their properties on there. And it's funny, um, you know, we look at availability, we look at occupancy, but we also look at availability and availability is the flip of occupancy, right? It's, you know, more properties being available. And we saw this impact for the, the Pope visiting, which was all this supply. If you look at it, it's this big kind of, you know, uh, curve up and then down, and it looks a lot like a Pope's hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we kind of now dub this the Pope's hat effect. Like, there's a, oh, we're seeing a Pope's hat uh, happening in XYZ place. Um, and that's just another example where it's a once in a lifetime event. People don't fully think through, you know, are, are people actually going to spend the night or are they just going to drive in? And what happened with the Pope was everyone in the mid Atlantic, you know, drove in for the day, saw the Pope and then drove three, four hours home rather than staying in Philadelphia overnight. And so in the end, you know, we kept prices constant because we saw the oversupply and hotels ended up having to drop their rates to even less than the following weekend, which was just an average weekend in order to try to get them booked. And so th that highlights the importance of looking at, uh, highlights two things. One, the importance of, of looking at both supply and demand and the relation between the two rather than just demand. Because if you have this huge supply, that affects things as well. But also the impact of just because something's an event doesn't mean it will drive demand for vacation rentals and thus an increase in price. And, and the last example of this that I'll give uh, is, is Christmas uh, and um, uh, Thanksgiving in, in some urban markets. Um, so like San Francisco, for instance, it's kind of famous for being the town with no children in it. Um, and, and what happens is things, you know, you think, oh, it's Thanksgiving, you should raise your prices. Thanksgiving is a, one of the lowest demand periods, especially for a one bedroom, but definitely the lowest demand periods in San Francisco because everyone leaves and goes to the suburbs or flies home to Boston or whatnot to, to celebrate Thanksgiving, lists their place on Airbnb while they're gone. They can pay on market booking. And nobody's coming to San Francisco because, again, it's the town with, with no children in it. Um, and so there's actually very little demand for Thanksgiving. And so just because there's an event doesn't necessarily know it mean that it's going to drive vacation rental demand. And so you always want to look directly at that data to get indications of, of how you should price. That's quite fascinating. And I think 
And, and and this obviously is is why companies like yours that offer this data and help companies and individuals to weave their way through this what what seems to be sort of a, a, a mess of data and and come up with the right price based on what the supply and the demand yeah. is. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the great part about it too, I always say, hey, you know, forget um, you know using us that we think we that we make it really efficient and we help you a lot. But even if you just look at this magical graph uh, of occupancy, which I gather mm. you'll you'll link to one like that is. You can just see so much beauty just in that one graph to see occupancy across the year. It just tells you so much, right? Mm-hmm. On its own, right? To know when, when these peak periods are. Um, the tough part actually though is, and I think where where we end up adding a lot more value, um, is, is figuring out what the price response should be to demand, right? And so a good example is we, we you know, uh, if you are in Maui, you know, in Hawaii, you don't need beyond pricing or any other tool or any other data to tell you, hey, a lot of people come here for Christmas, right? <laughs> Demand is up. If you're a manager there, you're probably selling out every single uh, every single room. But but the harder part is, okay, demand is up, but should I increase prices 40%, which is what most folks were doing in Maui before we, we kind of entered that market? Or should I increase prices 3x or 10x? What is actually that right? price response to that increase in demand. And that's where you really kind of benefit a lot from tools. But um, Mm -hmm. I mean, you you can benefit from two things. Like one is, you know, your own past history. But the problem with your own past history is you probably didn't push the limits as much, right? You weren't constantly saying, "Mm, can I get an extra 10% or 20%? Uh, No, that didn't work. Okay, let me rejigger that. And here's the exact right amount. Um, That's where software becomes really, really interesting because they're doing that across you know, hundreds of thousands of properties and data points and all these sorts of things. And so it can really narrow down on the right bit. Like, but telling you, hey, you should increase prices for Christmas in Maui, not that interesting. (laughs) Everyone knows that. (laughs) Um, By the time we publish this, you will have um, been to ResFest. You've probably been to VR Bay as well. But you'll have done your talk on holistic revenue management, how to go beyond just pricing. So, uh, you know, this is no spoiler here. (laughs) I, I was I was fascinated by the title. I wanted you to tell me what actually holistic re- revenue management meant. Yes, uh, which gets back to our first kind of point about you know revenue management is this broader category, and there's you know pricing is just one lever lever you can pull. Holistic revenue management is really about thinking about how can I drive more demand as well, and really it's kind of more demand focused supply. You don't have much control over supply, right? You can react to supply. Um, but usually you react in a, uh, you know, using price, right? But but demand is actually one thing that you can control a little bit more. And so we talk about this as, uh, you know, there's a couple good examples. One way to drive demand is honestly just to be avail- listed in more places. Um, if you have more eyeballs looking at your properties um, and, and looking to book them, you're increasing the demand. And, and basic supply and demand is as you increase demand, you can increase price. And so... One of the key things is, hey, if we see somebody's only, say, only has their own website, and yeah, they might get booked up a lot, right? And that's fine to get enough enough demand. But if they want to actually be able to increase rate, they might want to see about uh, increasing demand by being on other channels. And so whether it's Airbnb or Booking.com or HomeAway, that'll help increase demand. And so we always advise everybody to be on as many channels uh, as makes sense for them. Um, just so they can increase that demand, which will naturally increase your your rates because you have um, more demand coming coming in. It's just a basic economic. The second sort of part is around your website uh, and how you um, how you uh, optimize that one. You know, so you maybe have a lot of people coming, um, but are they converting? Right, thinking about like how you optimize that so that more people who are looking at your own website, if you get a lot of direct bookings there end up actually booking and that booking conversion flow because that can drive a lot more. Uh, if you improve that, then you'll get more booking, period, without any differences in pricing. And one element of that that's super important that plays really closely with pricing is how you rank properties that are more likely to convert. And so I'll give you an example. We have one property manager that we work with that has a website that does two things, I think, poorly. Um, and I think they'll fix it and it'll be a lot better. But they, um, when you search for uh, some dates, um, when it returns all the properties, it doesn't show any prices. 
to click in and go through. And so when you're looking at all of these, you already don't know, well, you know, here's a bunch, you know, this place is nicer, but maybe it's way more expensive. You can't really do that price to quality trade off right there. And so it becomes difficult to convert. The second thing it does is it doesn't surface the ones that maybe we've lowered prices on. So what we'll do is, you know, we might automatically, we might see a property. So you have two identical properties, both two bedrooms, like fronts or whatnot, right? And one of them is not booking well, maybe because it got a bad review or just because its photos are worse, right? Um, and so we'll automatically say, hey, there's less demand for this property. Let's lower that price. Mm-hmm. Now that only works if, People are suddenly seeing it more, right? And seeing that it's a lower price and deciding to book it. If your booking engine or your website isn't surfacing this new great deal, right? We reduce prices 20%. Um, then no matter how much we decrease that price, they're not going to see it and they're not going to book it. So you always need to make sure that you're optimizing uh, your own website the same way that, I mean, Airbnb and HomeAway, they all spent, they have, you know, dozens of engineers optimizing what gets brought to the top, right? Um, and so we'll find often, you know, lowering prices during lower season or lowering prices last minute or lowering prices for an underperforming listing will work really, really well with our clients um, whose properties are listed on all these OT- OTAs, online travel agencies, um, like <laughs> airbnbbooking.com and HomeWay. We talked about that. Um, uh, because their, their search algorithms surface these new, better deals, right? If that makes sense. Um, but if they get 80% of their bookings direct, they, their own website doesn't have as good a search algorithm to surface that new, better deal. Um, and so, uh, you know, we try to work with them to, to talk with their website provider about how they can do that or diversify so they get more demand. And so these are all kind of ways where um, there's more levers that you can pull other than just price to try to, you know, help you do what we try to do at the end of the day, which is make you more revenue from the same property. I'll give one last example and then I'll shut up about this. <laughs> Another good example is a driving last minute demand, right? Um, you know, especially folks in, I know you, you're you in a drive to market and that people can drive from Toronto up there. You know, there's a surprising number, even the Outer Banks is, you know, actually a drive to market. There's large population centers, you know, within a four hour drive of there. Those places, people can make last minute decisions to come up for the weekend if they see a deal. And, and then one way to drive that demand is, is just email marketing to, to your clients for any last minute availabilities that you have specials on, right? A way to drive demand that you might not necessarily get by just lowering your price on a, you know, Airbnb or a booking.com or a home away, um, where you just are trying to capture more of the, you know, existing demand that's there. Here you can actually spur more demand by reaching out to all these folks, you know, within that four hour radius to say, Hey, why don't you come out to, to the lakes or, or to the ocean or to the beach um, this weekend? Uh, we have great deals, um, which, which creates demand that wasn't there before. So that's what we mean. Yeah, this is, that's fantastic stuff. And it, uh, it made me, made me see, I mean, we've been complacent for many, many years because our you know demand is really, really high in the summer, July, August, demand is high. Supply is, has always been low. You know, the moment we put a, a new listing yep. up, it just got booked. There was right. that, that was it until this year. And um, we had, we, we were just taken out from left field here. When we got into June, we had a mass of availability. And it had wow. ne- never happened before. And we, we put yeah. in place a, and, and what had happened is that what, what's happened is that people don't want that full Friday, Friday or Saturday, Saturday week anymore. I mean, many do. Yeah. There's a lot of people do, but there's a lot more that now just want a, br- a short break, three days yep. uh, or a weekend. Yeah. And we had to do yep. a massive shift in our thinking um, so mm-hmm. we, I mean, we did it through, we hired digital marketers to come in and sell these weeks. So we, you've got 250 yep. weeks to sell and we did it. And yep. it, it was great. Yep. We, en- we ended the season on a, a, a really, really positive note, but it was a bit panicky at that yep. time. But all we yep. were looking at was just get the weeks filled, you know, whatever we'll, we'll, and we, but we didn't really look at how to maximize the, um, the, the revenue from, from those new things, which are short breaks in the summer. So, yeah. I mean, we're having to look at it in a different way. Um, certainly will be uh, next year. So it sort of leads me to my next question. 
you know, is, is, is this dynamic pricing and revenue management model that can be, can it be used in a range of vacation areas or is it best used in those locations that have got a density of properties in pro- close proximity, like the Outer Banks, I guess? Right. Um, no, I mean, it can be used anywhere. What you typically need is if you're in a place where there's only 10 properties within a 10 mile radius, no. You, you probably wouldn't want to use any tool. And the reason is, is that there's too much noise in the data, right? And so we're looking at fluctuations in demand and you want it to be statistically significant. And so what that means is, let's say you had only 10 similar properties. Uh, if one of them got booked, that would be this 10% jump in occupancy. That could say, oh my gosh, there's a big event, or it could just be total chance, right? Not a statistically significant signal if that makes sense. And so you need to just have enough, again, it's very, very small, you know, say 50 or so properties in that general area that behave generally similarly uh, in order to do that so you can have statistical significance. And then again, we have clients across the world in dense urban markets like London, in, you know, relatively spread out markets like Mendocino in California, other sorts of places um, as well. And so it really does work in, in most, most places. But, you know, I, I'm from uh, east of LA, Claremont, California. I, I think there's maybe a dozen or two uh, vacation rentals there. Uh, it, it doesn't work so much there. Um, you can look at the data. You, you just don't say it doesn't work. Um, you, you end up just being better off mm-hmm. uh, looking the data, understanding your high season and your low season and kind of manually setting them because it's just not that much uh, dynamism in the market. But the vast majority of markets, I'd say 95% of of all properties out there definitely can benefit from this. Um, But but one important point there too is, uh, you know, I think of it as as autopilot on a plane. We still have people sitting there in the front seat for now. Um, uh, you know, because, uh, there's always conditions that, that can, that can occur where, where you want to grab the wheel and you want to take control because any of these sorts of things are, are doing what's correct in statistically significant ways. Um, but there can always be factors, um, that it just can't get. My perfect example for this is you know, for those that went to Burma, if, if I get our timing right here, Heather, um, <laughs> yes. uh, in New Orleans is, um, you know, if if you go to like the to Bourbon Street um, and and you go to the French Quarter in New Orleans, um, you might be, have uh, um, some properties in the French Quarter, um, and they might uh, you know, say triple in price during during Mardi Gras. There might be a couple hundred of those properties, a little less now because of regulation. But um, there might be a couple hundred properties, but there might be one just right at this intersection on Bourbon Street. You know, right by Pat O'Brien's or wherever it might be, and and it's just the ideal. And there's four of these units overlooking Bourbon Street. There's only four of them, and they might go for 10x during Mardi Gras. And there's just no statistic, you know, statistically significant way to be able to mm-hmm. capture that. You just know that because of that. And that's you know, that's like pricing the presidential suite at a hotel, right? You know, you should make it more for for New Year's, but there's there's no statistical model that's really gonna uh, help you on that sort short of you know doing an auction because it's one of a kind, right? Um, so, so you always want to, to keep your eye on things. <laughs> Don't let the machines uh, go crazy, especially if you have a very unique property. I know we all have unique properties, but I, I, a very unique property. And I, I know how, you know, this this business is changing. And I, so certainly in, in our neck of the woods where in five years ago there were, there, there were a lot of properties for rent, but it, that that is just blown out the water in the last five years with Airbnb yep. coming into our, into our areas and more and more people yeah. renting out their properties. So I know that, you know, I've, I've come to, to talk to you before at, at booths, at conferences and yep. been a little wistful, you know, thinking I can't use this. And now I'm thinking that, yes, there, there is so much more data out there on our properties. I know where I live, there yep. are, thousands of properties now showing up on Airbnb. So hopefully we will start to be able to um, take on board some of these tools in the future. So Ian, um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about just about Beyond Pricing and what you can do for owners and property managers. (laughs) 
Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll limit the plug uh, <laughs> by any means because I'm not here for that. But, um, uh, you know, so, so beyond pricing, super simple to use. If you're an owner, uh, you can just go to our website um, uh, and connect your Airbnb or VRBO, Verbo, sorry, your Verbo. Uh, I got to change my, my <laughs> what I say, otherwise I'll get in trouble next week. Connect your Verbo, uh, sorry, three weeks, to get wherever we are on timing. Um, <laughs> Connect your Verbo directly to Beyond. Uh, it'll pull in all you know your property, um, all of your um, history, and, and automatically give you recommended rates um, that you can then instantly sync uh, to Airbnb or VRBO, Booking.com as well as coming very shortly. Um, and then you can also get some great stats about you know how your properties perform, some of these Rev Par, Rev Pay, and all the stuff we've talked about your occupancy, as well as market data. So you can see a lot of these graphs there. Um, you can actually just connect it and not turn it on. They don't charge you for any of that stuff. You can just look at the market data, go crazy. We think it's just great for everybody to have access to that data. And then if you're a property manager, um, you can do the same thing. Just contact us through the, through the website and we'll, uh, depending on your property management system, we c- cover most of them. We'll link that directly. Um, it'll pull in all your hundreds of properties or dozens of properties or whatever it is. Uh, and then you're able to um, get a few more tools to, to manage larger portfolios of properties um, pretty nicely. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we're just here trying to help you make more revenue. And, uh, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our job. And please let me know. <laughs> that's, that's, gr- that's great. Ian, I will make sure we have a, a link to beyond pricing on the, um, on the show notes. And, sure. and I would encourage anybody out there who's got questions to either contact who, who would, who would you like them to contact at, uh, at beyond pricing if they've got something they'd like to ask? Well, if you really want to, uh, I'm Ian at beyondpricing.com. Pretty simple. If you just have any other basic questions, uh, support at Beyond Pricing. We have some great folks there that uh, get back to you very quickly. Um, but otherwise, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always here. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's great, Ian. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's It's been very illuminating. Lots of really good information. You know, even if it's just getting all those acronyms sorted out so that we know what uh, what's being talked about the next time we go to a conference yep. we sit there and 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 exactly. hear them all so it's, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure i'm sure we will bump into you at some point at a conference near us <laughs> great looking forward to it. come by say hi we usually have mints very high <laughs> demand <laughs> <laughs> yeah th- thanks so much for joining me ian all right thank you heather i really appreciate it Well, that was a great conversation and I learned a lot from it. I'm not great on statistics and data and that sort of stuff. We can't be good at everything. I like to think that I'm pretty good at sort of content management and marketing, but I've always handed over the technical side and the data side to other people. So it was really good talking to Ian and getting that almost a lay person's version because that really made sense to me. I hope it made sense to you too. So if you've got questions for Ian, you can go directly to him at ian at beyondpricing.com. You can go to the show notes and put your questions there. I quite like that because it gets people to go to the show notes and actually read the stuff. And it's, it's I think you should go and have a look at the beyondpricing.com blog and have a look at some of these stats from the different cities they've been to. You have to go into the blog and go to the blogs about the places they've been. So they've been, it was ResFest in Las Vegas, um, the data conference in Atlanta, Guestival in Tel Aviv, uh, Streamline in Scottsdale. So, I mean, just kick off with those. And I think there's probably a few more beyond that. I didn't actually get around uh, checking those out. So for sure, go, uh, you know, go and have, have a look at the show notes and check out those links. So we sort of run out of time today and I haven't got around to doing a resource and I haven't got around to doing a book uh, review uh, that will probably come next week. But I'm sure, I mean, I hope you found the content of today's show really, really interesting. I'd love to hear from you if you are using dynamic pricing tools or techniques to find out what is working for you 
and get you to share that with other people if you're so if you're putting your comments on the show notes that would be really really great yes we are certainly going to be looking at this for our properties for next year it was just fascinating this year how the dynamic of our reservations changed and i don't think somebody said to me well do you think that was a one off and perhaps it had you know did it have something to do with the weather it just we had really really bad spring lots of flooding and it wasn't very it didn't actually get warm until june late in june and maybe that put people off booking so often we we have this what we call the january thaw and that usually which is a, a period around about the second week of january where it almost seems like winter's over you know this this the the warmth comes back the snow begins to melt and everybody gets excited about winter being over but of course it's not you get this this false excitement because you know darn well it's going to come back again and you're back in the ice box before you know it but we always know that when we get the january thaw we get a lot more bookings well we didn't have much of a january thaw this year and then often as we get in towards the middle to the end of march there is a period where temperatures can reach sometimes in the high 60s, low 70s for a couple of days and everybody gets spring fever and gets out and books because they're thinking about sunshine and warmth and summer after months and months and months of winter. Didn't happen this year. So we didn't have that boost in bookings in January and we didn't have it in March. It was just sort of a steady flow through January through April. And then it got us into the end of of the spring, leaving us with a large amount of availability. But the thing is, I don't want to risk it next year. I do. we, We are not going to risk it next year. So we are going to engage our digital marketing strategy much earlier this year than we did uh, uh, next year than we did this. And we'll also be looking at some form of, of dynamic pricing as well to boost occupancy at the peak times of, of the year. And then perhaps lower rates at times when we're, we're perhaps struggling a little bit when demand is much lower. So I'll be talking to, um, well, by the time this is published, I will have talked to Ian and uh, Beyond Pricing uh, at that VRMA, and uh, and we'll we'll be talking about it. We'll be talking about this in an office hours coming up very very soon. And I would like to probably get Ian onto that office hours and share his uh, share his expertise um, on that session. So, watch his space. We'll be letting you know. As ever, if you've got any questions for me, I'd love it if you come directly to me at heather at vacationrentalformula.com and I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Send me an email. It's always an absolute pleasure to hear from you. So that's it from me for another week. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.